you'll turn your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. One of the synoptic Gospels, meaning that it has a lot of similarities to the other synoptic Gospel of Matthew and Mark. John is a different gospel altogether. It's written totally differently. But these three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar. That's what synoptic means. They are similar, a lot of similarities in these three gospels. Luke is the longest, of course, of the gospels. He provides a lot of information, a lot of events unique to the book of Luke. But it's a great and wonderful study that we are in the midst of. We have come to the section in Luke chapter 6 that is Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, In chapter 6, beginning in verses 20, going through verse 49, it's a much, as I've told you in the last two weeks, it's a much smaller um, account of that event. Matthew is, excuse me, Matthew is three chapters. Uh, Luke is just the what, 29 verses, uh, but he says very similar things to what are said in the book of Matthew. This is his account of the Beatitudes we've been looking at, the first verses 20 through 26. I've decided to isolate uh, these because they're so important. They're so very important. When Jesus uses words like blessed and woe, I mean, you want to You just want to stop and make sure you understand that because you're talking about eternal issues here. You're talking about a person who has favor with God and someone who does not have favor with God. You see in verses 20, 21, and 22, four blesseds, um, four types of people that are blessed by God. Those who are poor, those who are uh, hunger, those who hunger, and those who weep, and those who are hated and ostracized. You see that in verses 21 and 22. Then you see the woes expressed in 23, 24, and 25, and in 26. Uh, and, And the question is, am I blessed or am I cursed by God? And that's the reason that we have slowed down. If you were to ask the people in the crowd that day, if you were to ask them, how can you be right with God? I guarantee you they would say the same kinds of things you and I hear people say today. Uh, They would say things like, be a good person. Many would say that. Many would say, in their context, be born Jewish. Um, in our context, be born an American, whatever. Uh, for them, it would be attend the synagogue. That's how you're right with God. Or keep the law and the ceremonies. Uh, pray and fast. Do the things we see the Pharisees doing. Do those things. That's how you can be right with God. That's how you can know that you are going to heaven. And all of those things have this in common. They are all externals. They are all th- that are on the outside of a man. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, on these, in these Beatitudes, drives things into the heart. It's not the externals that make you blessed in the eyes of God. It's the internal. It's what's going on on the inside. And that's why Jesus deals with these things the way, way he does, because he's profiling a true believer. Uh, he is showing us what a person who has walked through the narrow gate is like on the inside. He is showing us what a person who has passed out of darkness into light looks like on the inside. He is telling us what a person who has their lives built on a foundation that will withstand the judgment of God, what that person looks like on the inside. Jesus is giving us the in, inner man issues versus these outward things. It's not the outward things aren't important. We're going to see that later in the sermon. Uh, you determine uh, the root by the fruit. He'll say that later. But the point is, this is the root. These are the issues of the heart. These are the things that the saving and sanctifying work of God has done in the life of a person who belongs to Christ. These are not things you can just do yourself. 
You, you can't make yourself, quote, poor in the sense Jesus is talking about it. You can't make yourself hunger in the sense that Jesus is talking about it. You, the blessing of weeping we're going to see today. You can't, you can't make yourself do that. These are a work of grace in your lives. You must be the object of God's grace, His working, His stirring, His regenerating work in your heart. And Jesus is telling these people that, I believe, to make them hunger and want that. We want that. We recognize the externals are not going to get it. It's what's on the inside of a man that matters. And these are very um, paradoxical statements. Blessed are those who hunger you see that? Uh, you see that in verse uh, 20? Uh, excuse me, blessed are you who are poor. You see that in verse 20? The world looks at that and they, they say, no, that's not. You're not blessed if you're poor. Uh, blessed if, you, if you're uh, hungry. How's that? Uh, and, and today, blessed are those who weep. How's that? These are antithetical statements. These are divine paradoxes. Uh, divine paradox is when you take a truth someone has said and stand it on its end and it kind of draws attention to you. It stands out to you. You see that and you go, what's that about? What's that about? That's not the way we not normally think. That's not what we think is the way to be happy and blessed in life and prosperous in life. And Jesus says, uh, in my kingdom, these are essential heart attitudes that a true believer, a citizen of my kingdom has. And that is how we have been looking at these and studying these the last two weeks. They're all connected. You can't get a multiple choice test here. You don't just pick which one you like. Well, I don't care about the poor and the hunger. We'll, we'll try the weeping one. I can do that. Uh, or whatever. You, it, no, they all go together. They all go together. Um, this is... Uh, um, this is what is, happens to a person who is no longer into the externals. This is what God says is happening in his heart. You're going to see in this sermon, beginning in a couple of weeks, some moral imperatives. You're going to see statements like, love your enemies. You're going to see statements like, give to one another. You're going to see statements like, take the, the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You're going to see statements like that, moral imperatives that Jesus is going to give. But before he gets to those moral imperatives, he gives definition to who the citizens of his kingdom are, to those who belong to him, to the ones who can actually do those things. Folks, you can't do those things. You have no desire to do those things. You have no power to do those things. They're just nice ethics, but they're po you're powerless to do them unless verses 20 through 26 are true about you. You need, that def you need to be defined as a person who belongs to Christ, one who is blessed and who belongs to the Savior before you could even attempt to do those things. I told you blessed are the poor does not mean a vow of poverty, doesn't mean uh, a lack of, uh, of material goods. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He is talking about a poverty of spirit. The context is salvation. It's a spiritual issue that's being addressed here. We see that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Same idea here. I, I have no resources to save myself. I have no resources to make myself right with God. It moves from there to blessed are the hungry. Uh, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, who recognize they have no righteousness in themselves, and they hunger for it. Uh, both a positional righteousness and a practical righteousness, I think, are in view here because they go together, as I said last week. Positional righteousness, I need Christ's righteousness because I can't, come, I can't make righteousness happen in my own life. I can't be perfect, and that is what God demands is perfection. None of us can keep his law perfectly. Only Christ did that. I need Christ's righteousness imputed to, credited to me. 
That is what faith does. Faith justifies me based on what Christ has done. Faith uh, enables God to impute Christ's righteousness to me so that I can then live out righteousness in a practical sense. That's defining a Christian, but he hungers for that righteousness. We saw that so beautifully pictured in the the tax gatherer as he comes into the temple and he beats his breast. He won't even look up. He's crying out to God. "Uh, I'm unworthy, God. I have nothing, God. God, I need righteousness and I can't get it myself. And God justifies that man in Luke 18. That is what we're talking about in these attitudes. Today, we come to verse 21 of Luke chapter 6. It says in verse 21, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And then the opposing statement to that is found in verse 25, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. It sounds like he's saying happy or the unhappy, doesn't it? And that's what it almost sounds like. Let's try to understand what he means here. Let me tell you what he does not mean here. Let's start with that. He does not mean blessed are the spiritually depressed. He doesn't mean that. There's nothing about blessed about being depressed spiritually. Um, there are times we experience that. Elijah experienced that. And Elijah experienced that when most of the way most of us experience spiritual depression after some spiritual high. He had an incredible high experience with God on Mount Carmel. And then he goes into a low time in the desert wanting God to take his life. God had to re-energize him to use him from then on out. But it's not a blessed state to be spiritually depressed. Um, So that's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is not talking about blessed are those uh, with no joy. He's not talking about that either. That's not what this verse is saying. Martin Lloyd-Jones says our Lord is not saying blessed are the grim, cheerless Christians. He's not saying that. Um, God saved us from that, uh, and that does not make the gospel attractive when we're joyless and grim. Someone said, if, if you have the joy of the Lord in your heart, notify your face. You know, that's a, that's a good, I don't know who said that, but that's a good point. Um, so we're not talking about blessed are those who weep. We're not talking about uh, the idea that they have no joy, that there's something wrong with having joy. Something else is, this verse is not teaching is, blessed are those who never experience circumstances in their lives that bring happiness and joy. In other words, you can't have happy and joyful experiences in life. This verse says you can't do that. That's what some would say. And that is not what this verse is saying. Uh, A joyful heart is good medicine, uh, Proverbs 17 says. Paul says, God freely gives us all things to enjoy. The book of Philippians is a book on joy. So this verse is not telling us that we should never experience circumstances in our life that bring happiness and joy. That's not true. And finally, fourthly, blessed are those who sorrow and mourn over the difficulties of life. Um, You're going to have difficulties in life, and you're blessed if you um, sorrow and mourn over those difficulties. Um, That's true. We all have troubles. We all have difficulties. Uh, We're blessed when we go through those troubles. There are times of mourning and times of weeping. There are legitimate troubles that all of us go through. But that verse isn't talking about that. And the the main reason that verse is not talking about that is because he's describing a believer here. Even unbelievers have difficulties and trials in life. So we're not talking here about some universal experience that both believers and unbelievers go through. Uh, Unbelievers experience troubles in life, and they go through troubles in life. And they sometimes they go through them sometimes very well. 
So we're not talking about something that an unbeliever can do in this verse. We're talking about something that is unique to the believer. We're talking about something that, is, that, that defines and profiles for us what a true believer is. Blessed are those who weep. If you go to Matthew's account, it says, blessed are those who mourn. Um, mourn and weep. The context tells us that this, this verse is describing the character of those, like I said, who truly belong to him. It's not the troubles of life, but it's rather a weeping over our sin. It's a weeping over our sinful condition. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who recognize they have no spiritual resources. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. Now it's blessed are those who weep and mourn over their sinful condition. They have this inner conviction of their sin. It's very important. Um, We are weeping over sin. Those who weep over their sin, Matthew says, those who mourn over their sin, Matthew says, shall be comforted, meaning salvation, find forgiveness. They shall, those, this account here says, blessed are those who weep, they shall laugh. Uh, laugh is the expression of, of ultimate joy for the Christian. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But you, you get the idea that we are weeping over our sin. To keep this in mind, sin is uh, rebellion against God. Sin is desecration of God's glory. Sin is shaking our fist in, in God's face. Sin is saying to God, I want to go my own way. Um, I have no spiritual capital to make myself right with God because of my sin. And I mourn over my sin. I'm indifferent, uh, and I'm broken over that. Um, I'm broken over the fact that, God, I am sluggish in my spiritual growth. God, I am worldly. Worldliness creeps into my life. The believer is one who feels the weight of that on his soul and mourns over it. I'm not talking about necessarily just crying openly. I'm just talking about he feels the weight of that. He, he feels the discomfort of that. He feels the, that robs me of joy. And I hate, God, when something comes between me and you. I'm, I mourn over my lack of devotion to you. It really out of touch with this in our culture, and I realize that. We're really out of touch with this in our culture, and in our Christian culture especially. Mourning and weeping over our sinful condition. That used to be a lot more profound than it is today. If you get a copy of Valley of Vision uh, written by the Puritans, it's, a Puritan, it's Puritan prayers. Uh, you know, the Puritans didn't have everything right, but one thing they did have right was their prayers. Just read their prayers. Go to the section where they talk about the contriteness of heart, the, the, the sin and the seeking forgiveness of sin. And what you read is just the depth of their repentance, the, the depth of, uh, of their crying out to God, of recognizing God's holiness and their sinfulness. I'm not talking about before they becoming a Christian. I'm talking about throughout their Christian life. These are the kinds of prayers they prayed. You don't hear that much today. Think about David Brainerd, who was a missionary to the Indians in, uh, in uh, New England area. Uh, in his journal entry in 1740, he said this, in my morning devotions, my soul was exceedingly melted and bitterly mourned over my exceeding sinfulness and vileness. He had a real sensitivity to his sinfulness. Sin bothered him. And I think it's because we have a shallow doctrine uh, on what sin is and a shallow understanding of the holiness of God. But those are two reasons 
that I think that we don't mourn. But all true Christians mourn. A true Christian mourns. A true Christian weeps. A true Christian is affected by sin. You come into the kingdom of God by seeking forgiveness of sin. That's what salvation is about. Let me show you uh, an example in the pa- passage of Scripture. Go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Notice this example here. It says in verse 36, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, was requesting Christ to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So you get the scene here. A Pharisee has asked Jesus to come into his house to eat with him. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now the reality is everybody in that town is a sinner. Okay, so that's not what this is highlighting. This is highlighting there was something this woman was known for. Possibly she was a prostitute, possibly an adulteress, but she had some kind of reputation that she's labeled this way. When she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. So you had this notorious sinner coming to the house. I don't know if she was invited or not. I, I highly doubt it. She heard he was there and she got in somehow is more how I picture that. I can't imagine a Pharisee letting this woman into her, his house. But the point is, here's a woman with a reputation with this very expensive perfume and she comes in and, it, it's, and says, it says in verse 38, and standing behind him at his feet, she's too ashamed to get in front of him, but she's standing behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. At this point, she's now on her hands and knees down by his feet and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now, I'm sure people are starting to feel uncomfortable uh, with her in the room and what she is doing. She's weeping. Uh, There's a puddle of tears in addition to this perfume that is being um, anointed, anointing Christ. Um, uh, Very self-deprecating, very self-denial on her part to get down on her hands and knees and do this. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, if Jesus, if this Jesus were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Uh, He's letting himself be defiled by this sinner. Jesus answers him. He's thought this to himself, we're told in verse 39, but Jesus knows what he's thinking, verse 40, and answers what he's thinking in verse 40 by saying, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. He says in verse 41, a money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and folks, that is a huge amount of money. That is an insurmountable amount of money. I can't even, it's more than you can imagine. 500 denarii, 50 is a lot. The other person had 50. Jesus is is giving this parable or this uh, example, uh, and one of the people in this example is going to be the Pharisee, and one of the people in this example is going to be this woman. So you have two people, and one of these people has a debt, a debt of 500 denarii, an insurmountable debt of 500 denarii, the other has 50. The picture is a debt of sin, but he's using money as the illustration here. But the point is the debt of sin is huge on both parts. But one is really, really huge. When they, verse 42, when they were unable to repay, neither one of them could repay it, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? That's the question. Neither could pay it. He forgives both of them. Ask the question. 
Simon answered and said, and Simon can barely get the words out because I think he's getting the point. I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Those who are forgiven much, love much, right? This woman is at Jesus' feet. She's a sinner. She recognizes that she is a sinner. She's willing to admit she's a sinner. See, Simon's a sinner. Simon needs Jesus just as much as she does. But Simon doesn't see it. You see the point? Simon doesn't see that he is poor. Simon doesn't have any hunger. Simon doesn't weep over his sinful condition. You see the point? This woman is poor in spirit. She realizes she has nothing. She is unworthy. She doesn't come with pride. She comes in humility. She comes hungry. She comes weeping over her sinful condition. She needs Jesus. She needs Christ. Simon, the only one that wept in this room was her. You don't, you didn't. She recognized she's separated from God and she mourned over it. She will be comforted by God. She will laugh, will have joy. You know the reason that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit? Do you know one of the reasons he sent the Holy Spirit? It tells us in John 16 that the reason he sends the Holy Spirit is to convict you and me to convict us, to bring about repentance, to bring about and show us our need for righteousness and for salvation. Listen to these words. And he, when he comes, he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin. That's what he convicts us of, is sin. When I break God's law, as an unbeliever, to bring me to salvation. As a believer, that I'm continually going and confessing my sin before him. I, I, this is part, present participle. You never stop weeping. You never stop hungering. You never stop recognizing your status of poverty with no resources in yourself. These are continuous through the Christian life. No one gets saved apart from conviction. Understand that. Conviction of sin. Because sin is the issue. Sin is the issue in salvation. Christ died for sin. And if you don't understand that, then you don't even know why you need a Savior. If you don't see yourself as a sinner, you don't know why you even need a Savior. Somebody said, well, I didn't feel conviction when I got saved at five years old. Then you might want to rethink whether you were really saved at five years old. You really might. If that's what you're holding on to is a five-year-old commitment, a five-year-old prayer, and you never felt conviction of sin, then you might not be a Christian. I wouldn't base it on that five-year-old prayer. I wouldn't base it on any prayer, to tell you the truth. I'd base it on the Beatitudes. This is where you need to look to see whether you're really a Christian or not. Not a prayer. It brings about this deep pain, um, inward contrition, contrition that feels the weight on the soul. If you've never felt the weight of your sin on your soul. See, that's what, that's what this, this is saying. So it makes you a believer. You recognize that. In Acts 2.37, I don't have time for you to turn to all these. Just listen to this. In Acts 2.37, Peter at Pentecost is preaching a sermon to the Jews that are gathered in Jerusalem. He is telling them, you have killed your Messiah. You killed Jesus, your Messiah. 
And it says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter, what shall we do? They were stabbed to the heart. We are guilty sinners, Peter. What do we do? We deserve hell, Peter. God have mercy on us, Peter. What shall we do? Peter says, repent. Each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, it was the preaching um, on their sin that brought about conviction by the Spirit of God that stabbed their heart. And they cry out for mercy. 3,000 souls were saved that day. A therapeutic gospel will not do this. Uh, an easy gospel of just everybody believe in Jesus to fix your problems will not do this. It is the recognition that you are a sinner, you are separated from God, you're at war with God, you're rebellion against God, you shake your fist in God's face, you turn your own way. It is a weeping over that condition, the recognition of that condition. James says it in James chapter 4. He says it like this, draw near to God. If you read James 4, what you have there is uh, uh, how to get along in relationships with people and why you have conflicts in relationships with people. It's because of what's in your heart, James says. And then he comes to this statement in verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn. Be miserable and mourn. That's inside stuff. You want to fix this, these lousy relationships that you have? Be miserable and mourn. You've got an inward problem. That's the context here. You've got a heart issues going on here. Be miserable and mourn. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Listen, you don't have anything to laugh about. You don't have to. Here, here's what the world's view of, of this is. They say, don't deal with the problems. Just laugh them off. Be indifferent towards them. Don't think about negative things like this. Don't, don't spend your time thinking about bad stuff. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Keep the party going. Don't think about it. Don't take the time to do that self-evaluation of your own heart. And in this context of relationships, my goodness, we need more people to sit back and ask, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I'm the problem in this relationship. Maybe it's my evil and wicked heart that's the problem, and I need to cry out to God to change me. And we're quit trying to change everybody else. That's just a side sermon, but that's, that's James 4. I'll tell you another uh, passage um, is found in Romans 7. You, you're familiar with Romans 7. Go to Romans 7. In Romans chapter 7, uh, at the beginning of this sermon, in Roman, excuse me, of this passage in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul says that he was really convicted, and I, I saw this in the video this morning by R.C. Sproul of how Martin Luther was so convicted by the law. This is that's really good. That's what the law is there for, to convict you. And make you cry out to God for mercy. But in Romans 7, I'm not going to go through that whole passage, but you can read in the beginning of that where he talks about, he, he, he would read the law where it said, the 10th commandment, do not covet. And he was realizing my externalism is not enough. This is a pre-conversion, this is a uh, pre-conversion passage, I believe, these verses in the beginning of Romans 7 regarding Paul. The, I would look at that law, thou shalt not covet, and I realized that um, my externalism was not enough. My externalism couldn't shut down my coveting heart. 
He said, I was really convicted about that, that I could not meet God's standard, do not covet, no matter what I look like on the outside. So I was condemned by the law, Paul says in Romans 7. I was spiritually dead, Paul says, because of that command. That's what the law does. It convicts you. It judges your heart. And so he said that sort of giving his spiritual biography there at the beginning of Romans 7. Well, then he comes later in Romans 7, and I believe this is 30 years later stuff in Romans 7. I believe he describes, beginning in verse 15, his experience right now. And you're familiar with this. Um, Here I am now, 30 years later, for what I am doing, I do not understand. Verse 15 of Romans 7, for I am practicing, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Folks, this is the experience of every Christian. You have this new life in you that wants, gives you new desires, And you want to do those things, but you don't do them. That's my experience. Paul goes on and says, but I do the very thing I don't want to do. I agree with the law, confessing the law is good. So no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. Sin is in me. There's my unredeemed humanity that I still have to deal with. I had this new life in me, but I had this unredeemed humanity that I still live in. Verse 18, for I, know, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is my flesh. I have this unredeemed flesh to deal with. There's a new person in Christ in my flesh. Verse 19, the willing, and this is the reason I say this is a, a, a Christian experience, not a pre-Christian experience like some people say. This is a post this is a christian experience because you wouldn't say the willing is in me of an unbeliever for the willing is present in me verse 18 says um verse 19 says but the doing of the good is not for the good i want i do not do but i practice the very evil that i do not want Once again, the reason I believe this is talking about a believer, that's characteristic of a believer, not an unbeliever. I do not want, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner. And then what does he do? He cries out, and this is the weeping. This is the mourning I'm talking about. Wretched man that I am. That's the soul, that's the soul that weeps. I'm not saying it's shedding a puddle of tears. I'm not saying it's some outward display of losing it. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying there's this mourning, this sadness. I'm not, and I'm not even saying there's an oversensitivity either. You can get too crazy with, some, with, with, with this whole idea that I'm trying to say it, and think it's just this oversensitive spirit. No, I'm not saying that either. I'm saying it's this realization, God, I am a wretched man. No good thing dwells in me. My flesh keeps popping up at the most inopportune times. God, I hate this sin that is in me. You see a sensitivity to that. He mourns it. He doesn't want it to be there. Who's going to set me free from this? Thanks be to God. Verse 25 says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. On the one hand, I, I'm, I'm serving the law of God. On the other hand, my flesh, the law of sin. One day our groaning will be over, folks. We'll be out of this body, right? But right now we, we groan. We, 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 we weep over that. We say, God, is." I take two steps forward, and I take one step forward, two steps backwards, however Swindoll's book title goes. But the point is, I never feel like, I feel like I'm going backwards sometimes. Someone's described the Christian life as you will never be sinless, uh, but you're going to hate sin more. Growing and maturing in the Christian life is growing to hate sin more because you're getting to know God better You're hating sin more. 
and more. 2 Corinthians 7 talks about earthly sorrow that leads to death. People feel bad about a lot of things they do. This is not earthly sorrow. This is godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7. This is godly sorrow that leads to repentance. It's a true sorrow, a true sorrow. You have to be really careful with these, some of these hyper-grace teachers because sometimes they desensitize you to the sin. They desensitize you to it. Folks, I know I'm forgiven for all of it, yes. But it's that recognition that, God, I, I hate it because you hate. I hate what you hate, God. And I want to turn away. I want to be more conformed to the image of Christ. I want my sanctification to be, I want to become more and more like Christ. And part of that is, is turning from sin and always turning from sin, always confessing my sin. If we are those who are continually confessing our sin, that's the tense of 1 John 1, 9, we are those who are continually being forgiven for our sin. Here is just a couple more and I'll conclude. It is not just our own sin that bothers us, but it's the the power and the presence of sin in our fallen world. And that's what we were praying about earlier in the service. We are bothered by Dallas. We're bothered by Orlando. We're bothered by the consequences of sin. We're bothered by the gay marriage stuff. We're bothered by the transgender stuff. We're bothered by all of those things because we see them destroying people's lives, not making life better. None of those things make man's humanity flourish. This world has no basis to say life matters because they don't have God. Only God gives us reason to say lives matter. Otherwise, it's just some subjective opinion of different groups of people. But for us, everybody's life matters because of God. And God sent a gospel into this world for man. Because man's lives matter. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. We mourn over the, the Psalm 119, 136. We mourn over that. We mourn over legislation that comes out and just promotes immorality that we know is going to destroy lives, not help people's lives. It's an interesting passage in Ezekiel 9, 4. The Lord is speaking to the pre-incarnate Christ. There's an impending judgment coming on the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord says, go into the midst of the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in their midst. You hear that? Go and mark out those men in that city who care about the abominations going on around them, who are mourning over the sinful condition of their culture. They will be spared. Mark them out. That's Ezekiel 9.4. Go into that city and mark them out. They care about the evil being committed in their midst. They know God, and they care about the sins in their culture. Let me jump to why are those who weep blessed? Matthew says in Luke 6, Matthew says in Matthew 5, they are comforted. Luke 6 says they will laugh. Those who weep will laugh. Um, I believe the reference is the same. They will be comforted. They will, they will experience forgiveness and peace for forgiveness of their sin 
because the issue is sin. They will laugh in terms of the ultimate joy that's connected to forgiveness. They will laugh in that sense. Isaiah 40 says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly of Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed. You find forgiveness. Your iniquity is removed. There's comfort. There's joy. There's joy in being right with God. That's the point. Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledge my sin to you. David is speaking. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, for the believer, sin presses on his soul. And if you read Psalm 32, you see David's sin was pressing on his soul so much that he was a miserable human being. He was so sensitive to the sin that he had committed once it was pointed out to him. And he says, it wasn't until I acknowledged my sin. I was groaning and I was burdened and I was feeling the weight of my sin and I confessed it and I sensed your comfort. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Look in verse 25 of Luke 6. Woe to you who laugh now. This is your party right now because it's not going to keep on. If you're an unbeliever, you're under the curse of God. If you're an unbeliever and you are, quote, laughing at sin, indifferent towards sin, redefining sin, listen to our culture. Our culture has redefined sin. This is what laughing at sin looks like. Laughing at sin is when you call... uh, uh, outburst of anger, now you call it frustration. The Bible calls it an outburst of anger. And now we've changed it to frustration. It sort of civilizes it. Uh, the world calls it drunkenness. Excuse me, the Bible calls it drunkenness. We call it alcoholism. We, the world calls it the Bible calls it fornication. We call it premarital sex. The, the, the Bible calls it adultery. We call it, the world calls it an affair. Do, are, you see how it tones it down? The, 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 the Bible calls it homosexuality. The world calls it gay. They, they redefine good. That's laughter. That's laughter. You laugh now. Cursed are you who laugh now who are indifferent, who think it's no big deal, think God will just get over it, who rationalize it and rename it. You come up with comfortable euphemisms for it. You're not part of his kingdom if you do that. You're not part of his kingdom. Jesus is very black and white in this passage. You're cursed or you're blessed. There is nothing in between You're either in my kingdom or you're in Satan's kingdom. If Spurgeon said, if you can look on sin without sorrow, then you have never looked on Christ. Unbelievers laugh at their own sin. They laugh at the sins of others. Jesus says, you better get all your laughing done now. Because what does he do? He does, when he describes hell, he calls it a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. I would recommend you weep now. Weep now over your sinful condition. When Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door, the first one, you know what the first one said? It said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. That's the first one. The entire life of the believer is to be a life of repentance, of turning away from sin, mourning over our sin. So, see, the Beatitudes are a test. They're a test. That's why I've isolated them and taken so much time on them because they're so important. They're a test for you and me. Am I blessed or am I cursed? Am I, I recognize my poverty 
of spirit, that I have nothing? Do I recognize that I'm hungry for righteousness because I don't have it? Do I recognize that I'm a sinner separated from God, rebellion to God? And the good news of it all is if you are a Christian, you can look at this and go, thank you, God, for your work of grace in my heart. Father, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you, God, for your your grace and power that works in our lives and does this inward work in us, a work that we can never do ourselves. I pray, Father, that if anyone is here this morning and they look at this and they say, none of those characterize me, that I pray, God, that that would be that would be a work of your spirit in their life right now to make these a reality, that they would cry out to you, God, for that grace and mercy and power that can change the heart. We love you and thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.